It was nearly midnight when I finally reached the city I called home. I spent the last week on a business trip covering some remote parts of my sales territory. I work for a large multinational drug manufacturer, and my responsibility was to convince the medical staff in my territory to recommend our branded products above all others. Every six weeks, I had to spend a week away from home to cover my area regularly. My day went from visiting one doctor's office to another, promoting our products and leaving free samples where possible highlighting the qualities that set our brands above the ordinary. It was a game of averages. One time out of six times a day you might get lucky and get to talk directly to the doctor. Most of the time you were talking to the head nurse or the person assigned to deal with people like me. My wife and I wanted to pay off our debts before starting a family. I left on Sunday this week so I could be there early in the week. In addition... When I submitted my daily reports this Thursday at 7 p.m., I received a call informing me that the regional sales manager had given me permission to go home and take an extra day off with pay. I again exceeded plans for the quarter. These visits at unusual times finally brought me visibility. When I worked in these places, I spent extra long hours on business trips visiting these medical facilities after working hours. This may not have made a big difference in terms of promotion, but when I filled out my daily reports and sent them by email, it spoke for itself. I found that I spoke directly with more doctors this way than during a typical day. Most of them had quiet hours, which made it easier to have open and honest one-on-one -on -one discussions with them. This allowed me to pass on knowledge about what was new, why it was better, or what to look out for if there were complications when taking the medicine with others. This earned me a lot of respect from the doctors in the field, most agents in the field, like me, did not approach this customer channel because they saw it as repeating what had already been done. I have found this to be the best way to reach doctors directly, since most of these operations served clients without appointments after opening hours. From four to six was their quiet time. As long as my fellow salespeople completed their daily visit schedule, they were happy. My way of looking at things was that if you constantly do more than what is required on odd days when you don't follow through, it won't be taken seriously. Maybe it was because I was the youngest and newest member of the sales team, which fueled my ambition. Some days I skipped lunch to reach out to a couple extra contacts. I must admit that I am a people person and had a gift of persuasion that seemed to make people feel at ease when interacting with me. On a personal note, if I wanted to cheat on my wife, I would have plenty of options, especially on the road. In every city and place, there was always some young, attractive person, new to the field for various reasons, ready and planning to flirt with those who they thought were better placed than the majority. Those who knew me on the field called me a cunning dodger because I always found a way to get out of sticky situations without leaving any grudges behind. My mother cheated on my father regularly when I was a teenager. We three children knew this. We also knew the man's name and reputation. I watched my father suffer from emotional pain for years. On the rare occasions when I ran with my father, we talked. He felt trapped and at a loss at the same time. Because of his views on responsibility to children, he remained in a loveless marriage. I knew that when the time was right, he would take steps. My mother treated my father like dirt. As a result, I made a promise to myself that I would never allow myself to be like my mother. I could not and did not want to intentionally hurt another person. One night, my mother and I had an argument. I called her what she was, a cheating girl. She said that my father does not have the courage to leave her because he loves her too much. I told her to be careful because her own words could come back to her with great force. Mom found out the hard way how wrong she was. As soon as the last of his children, that is me, graduated from high school, he took his revenge. They said it was an accident, but the facts still don't make sense in my eyes. I still believe that because of what happened, his love turned into hatred, which allowed him to take revenge. My mother and her long-term lover, who was her employer, fell off a cliff after my father confronted them demanding that their relationship be permanently ended in every sense. My mother made the mistake of telling my father that he was not a man, and the only reason she stayed with him was because he was such a good provider. She then told him to his face that now that their children were grown, 
she would file for divorce. They had separated and he had just left the family home a few days earlier when it happened. One evening, before filing for divorce, my mother and her lover decided to try a new restaurant that had opened on top of a bluff outside of town. For the elite, this was the place to be. Access to the restaurant was difficult as it was on a steep bluff overlooking the Mississippi River, so most used GPS to get to it. It appears that the GPS in my mom's lover's car was faulty and gave the wrong directions. They missed the restaurant by just a block and fell off a cliff in the dark during a storm. The police did not take into account in their investigation the fact that my father wrote the code and could easily have found a way to program it to fail. Her parents and relatives had a great discussion with my father about how to handle her funeral. He wanted to cremate her and nothing more. This led to a big argument, so he told them all what her relationship was with the man she died with. They wanted proof, so he provided it. He provided them with a video. From her own mouth, she stated how long their affair lasted and what she thought about her husband and her children. Let's put it this way. When they heard the evidence from her own mouth, her side of the family better understood my father's point of view. If they wanted to give her a big funeral, they could pay for it themselves but I wouldn't come. None of us kids came either, because we all felt the same way. Her family eventually buried her very quietly under her maiden name. It seemed like the truths coming out of her own mouth said it all. Even her own family had no respect for her after my father revealed her true thoughts. The death notice appeared in the newspaper after it was all over. I turned the last corner heading towards our house when I saw someone else's car parked in our driveway. I stopped at the edge of the road opposite the curb to collect my thoughts because due to my parents' relationship, I was already on guard. I quietly approached the house, which was plunged into darkness. Using the flashlight function on my cell phone, I peered through the garage window and confirmed that my wife's car was there. This meant that the unfamiliar car parked in front of the house was not a replacement and had no reason to be there at that time of night. I checked the license plates on the car and found out they were local. Since my wife is allergic to alcohol, she could not serve such drinks to guests. I opened the front door after discovering that the security system was turned off. It was unusual. We usually turned on the alarm before going to bed. The wife's family home was burglarized when she was young. So as soon as we bought the house, the alarm system was installed and used constantly. I went to my gun cabinet and grabbed my double-barreled shotgun, I didn't know what was going on, but I wanted to be prepared for the worst in case. After loading it with one round, I took off my shoes and walked up the stairs to the bedroom. The door was wide open. I could see them both, deeply asleep, tarried from the passion of their lovemaking, thanks to one lamp on the nightstand. A huge man was sleeping on top of my wife's back. There was blood on the sheets. The room smelled of the stale smell of sex. It's time to make a decision. I quietly returned to the living room to think. Should I go back upstairs and remove them, as I believed my father had done or not? I don't know how much time I spent thinking. Finally, I decided what to do. This was not the time and place to do what I thought my father had done, because there would be no chance for me to escape. This could not be presented as an accident. No matter what they did, I had to face the fact that they weren't worth going to jail for life over. It looks like my wife was having her period which explains where the blood came from. No matter how you looked at it, it didn't look like consensual sex at first glance. So I called the police. I quietly called 911, explaining that I had come home to find a man I didn't know, apparently asleep after having sex with my wife. I asked them to send the police and come through the front door since it was open. After the call ended, I went back upstairs. I could already hear sirens in the distance, Entering the bedroom, I fired a shot at the ceiling. Gypsum dust fell all around and on them as they quickly woke up to see a gun pointed straight at their faces. Both my wife Ginny and Doug Drysdale were stunned and in shock. I was the last person they expected to see. This was going to get interesting. Before giving them a chance to compose themselves as they sat down, I spoke. For now, I suggest we all keep quiet, I said. The police are on their way. I am not a large man, weighing only 160 pounds, 
and standing five feet nine inches. I'm still 32 inches around my waist. At school, I was involved in athletics. I excelled at long distances. This was something I continued to do every weekend because during a long run, I could feel the tension draining away from me. Ginny, my wife, weighed about 110 pounds, had a slender figure, firm buttocks, and beautiful full breasts. Her height was at most five feet six inches. She worked as an executive assistant at a law firm. We met in our first year of university and lived together for two years before getting married. I loved her very much and never expected this. At that moment, I realized how quickly love can die. The man who had been with her earlier was six feet three inches tall and weighed 250 pounds. He obviously had a 40-inch waist, and I could see that his body was practically all muscle. He was also my boss's boss. I knew that the only thing keeping me from ending up in the hospital right now was the shotgun in my hands. To everyone who knew him, he was a complete asshole. When the police squad entered my house, they called my name and I answered, pointing in the direction of the bedroom. They entered the room with their weapons drawn, expecting the worst. The first thing they asked upon entering was for me to put my gun on the floor which I did. The first thing one of the officers did was push my gun away before putting his own away. I was asked to put my hands behind my back and I complied. They quickly handcuffed me and took me out of the room. I was told to sit in the living room while they finished examining the scene. Another police officer called an ambulance to check on my wife. I knew they had to wonder if I had shot her in anger. A police officer took a naked man into custody after allowing him to put on his pants. He was caught on camera by news crews being placed half-naked in the back of a police car. The story was broadcast live. Ginny, my wife, was photographed as she was loaded into the ambulance for transport to the hospital. This is where things started getting interesting for me. I was going to be the center of attention. A female detective arrived and took charge. After speaking with two officers who were processing the scene, she approached me. I told her my story, explaining that I had returned home unexpectedly. She took me, still handcuffed, back to the bedroom and asked me to tell her my story as it happened. I showed her where I used the gun to shoot through the ceiling. When she checked the gun, she found that I had only loaded one round into it. Very smart move, she said. This shows that you were only trying to scare them to control the situation. Considering your size compared to his, your action can be justified. It also negates any charges of attempted murder, which I'm sure will be raised when I question them later. When she saw all the blood, she said out loud, I would have thought something was wrong here too. I gave her my explanation of how it all happened and gave her my boss's cell phone number. I listened as she called my boss, waking him up from a sound sleep. Fortunately, he confirmed my story. It was noted that my presence at home was not expected, but due to my achievements at work earlier in the week, I was given Friday off. Credit cards will confirm the time I checked out of the hotel. I will be required to pay for the entire night, even though I checked out early. The fact that I was still wearing my work clothes was noted by the detective. The policewoman, after removing the handcuffs, suggested that I find a hotel room for the night and contact them tomorrow to find out when I would be allowed to return home. I told her I was going to go to the hospital emergency room to fill out medical forms and provide her insurance information. The female detective walked me to my company car. On the way to her, she gave me her business card. After checking, she discovered that my suitcases and product samples were still in the trunk. I heard her comment to herself, It's good when a person's statement can be easily verified. It saves us time and doesn't force us to go in the wrong direction. The morning paper mentioned Ginny and Doug Drysdale. It was noted that this was adultery. Colin, this is a disaster. Thanks to the media attack last night and this morning, the wives of other sellers have started to come out, Lucas said. It seems our boss used our schedule to decide which woman he would deal with and when. We told our sales staff to have their wives report everything directly to the police station. Today is a lost day for everyone because everyone is upset about what happened. It's really confusing because some of the things these women are saying about Doug don't make sense. Headquarters is panicking that this is all coming out. Lucas explained. 
Thanks for letting me know, Lucas, but we still don't know what's wrong, I said. It's looking more and more like Doug planted something on my wife. If no charges are filed, I'm turning in my resignation. I won't work for the man who cuckolded me. Take your time, Colin, Lucas replied. Let me convey your thoughts to HR when I tell them what I've learned. You may not be the only one who feels this way. Either way, he has used his powerful position and knowledge in a way that could put the entire corporation at risk. Big legal problems that they didn't want. I'm giving you a week of paid medical leave so you can figure this out, Lucas said. Don't worry, I'll keep you posted on this side. I don't want to lose you because you act hastily. I found an inexpensive hotel near one of the main entrances to our city. After checking in, I collapsed on the bed in my clothes, having been awake for almost 30 hours straight. Sunset had already come when I woke up. It took me a few minutes to collect my thoughts. After opening my suitcase and choosing some fresh clothes, I took a quick shower and shaved before checking my cell phone. I missed eight calls. When I contacted the response service, I found six messages left for me. One each from my wife's parents and my father, two from my boss with updates on what was learned, and two from the female detective investigating the case. The first thing I did was call the police detective. Hello, this is Colin McBride, I said. Detective Benton, have you tried to contact me? Thanks for calling back, she said. Your boss told me you were up all night. I hope you slept well. Actually, I just woke up. It was around noon when I checked in, I replied. How can I help? I have a few questions for you, Detective Benton said. But more importantly, I have a lot of news for you. After the morning media fog, a lot of background information has been revealed. This raises many questions about what really happened. Well, I was just getting ready to get dressed and go out to dinner, I said. Maybe I can grab something along the way and bring it to the station. Well, she said. Since I haven't eaten yet and you're not a suspect, what if we meet somewhere in about an hour? That will give me time to change my clothes and take a shower. Sounds good to me, I responded positively. Name the place. She made it. Since I had time, I called Lucas, who answered immediately. Hey, Colin, have you talked to the detective yet? He asked first. Meeting her in an hour to discuss a few things, I said. I called her first as soon as I woke up, and now I'm calling you. It appears that Doug Drysdale's days with the company are numbered. Our head office personnel department has been instructed to terminate his employment as soon as possible for violating the moral standards in his contract, Lucas said. We learned that five other sales representatives had wives who dated Doug regularly. Your wife was only one of them. Mrs. Drysdale has already hired a lawyer and will get him fired. By the time she is done with him... He will be finished in every sense, Lucas revealed. She seemed to be convinced that he was staying late in after-work meetings every Thursday. Our head office is sending legal representation to fire him tomorrow. Wow, they're moving fast, I said. I've been ordered to send six of you to the corporate office branch as soon as things start to settle down, Lucas explained. For the time being, I will be doing both Doug's job and my own in this regional office. Honestly, Am I still on vacation for next week? I asked. Yes, and longer with full payment if necessary, Lucas replied. HR confirmed my decision. Hell, they even praised me for it. Unofficially, they think you're one of the best field agents we have and are afraid we'll lose you. Your reports always contain new locations and marketing opportunities for us. With this complimentary approach to handling our products, we have seen a noticeable increase in volume from your area. I arrived at Olive Garden to find Detective Benton waiting for me. Rush hour at the restaurant has already passed. The hostess soon showed us to our table, which was half closed. I was surprised to see the detective out of uniform. However, she considered our meeting so important that she dressed smartly and stylishly. I loved seeing the lady in the dress and the one she wore was designed to impress. If she was trying to impress me, she did a great job. Detective Benton was blonde this time, but I could see traces of her dark roots. She was about my height and had a good figure. If I were free, I would be interested to know where this might lead. 
I put on black pants, a soft yellow shirt, and a black sports jacket. It wasn't anything special to me since it's what I wore to work. As soon as we sat down, she informed me that toxicology tests had found no illegal substances in my wife's blood. The argument that a prohibited drug was used for deliberate intoxication disappears. Three of the five other women who found themselves in sexual relationships with Doug Drysdale admitted that they were forced into an ongoing affair with Doug, but there were never any direct threats, although much was hinted at. They only met with him on a Thursday night every six weeks. Their memories of what happened and how it happened are at least confusing, which lets me know that something is missing in this situation, she explained. His power and influence over their husbands' careers will be taken into account by the district attorney. Each of the women knew about the others, and they all kept each other's secrets because they wanted their husbands to keep their jobs. They only saw Doug when their spouses were on business trips, and it was only for one night. This gives the DA more leeway when considering charges. The three she's interviewed so far believe they were asked to try special sex and turn down Doug Drysdale more than once, but can't say for sure. They now feel that as a result of your intervention, they are freed from being used by this beast, if they ever were. The DA will have a lot of things to consider before moving forward with this. Their statements seem rote and deliberate, as if they were trained. What can I say? Even though there was power and influence, they were all adults and consenting adults, said Detective Benton. It leaves room for defense. If your wife said no, it's still considered that he took her by force, Detective Benton explained. Thanks for the information, Detective Benton, I said. With the knowledge you've given me, I can now move forward as if my marriage was over, even if things went too far that night. Ginny could have been honest about his intentions with me from the beginning of their relationship, and I would left her job. It seems like, given how long this went on, there was something else that attracted her. This implies that she felt or believed that there was something missing in me that she found in her relationship with him. Unfortunately, I will probably never know what it was or why. For some reason, Detective Benton had a big smile on his face. Colin? If we can get on the phone, my name is Fiona. It was actually a very enjoyable dinner. We both enjoyed the unlimited salad more than the pasta. With things completed, we both relaxed and began to get to know each other better. My wife's situation was never discussed again. It was almost 10 o'clock in the evening when we parted. As we were leaving the restaurant, she informed me that I could return home tomorrow. The forensic team has completed its work. After returning to my motel room, I called Ginny's parents and told them what I knew about Doug Drysdale's relationship with Ginny. According to other women involved in the case, the relationship between Ginny and Doug was regular. They met regularly when I was on business trips. This means that their relationship began about six months after I was hired. Both of them were in complete shock. I strongly advised them to contact their daughter and ask her where she would like to live because I filed for divorce earlier in the week. My father, when I spoke to him, congratulated me for handling the situation so professionally. He said that if I wanted, I could move in with him until I sorted things out. I told him I would think about it. On Sunday morning, I did something I hadn't done in years. I went to church. I walked in just before the service began, taking with me the Bible I had gotten from my motel room. My grandfather, although not a religious man, sometimes turned to the Bible to find answers when he didn't have any. I thought, what the hell? If it worked for him, it could work for me. The pastor's sermon was about forgiveness and letting go. One of the things he insisted on over and over again was that he needed to forgive himself for allowing himself to be in this situation. It was a point of view that I would never have thought of had I not heard it. I was just leaving the church, heading to my car to go home and start cleaning when Fiona saw me. She stood with an elderly couple, talking to the minister. Colin, what an unexpected surprise, Fiona said. Meet my parents. I walked up and met them. Fiona introduced me as a friend. Her father asked me how I liked the service. This led to him and I having a short conversation about forgiveness. Fiona seemed surprised to see me freely expressing my point of view. I said, 
The pastor never said this, but he made me think. If we haven't forgiven ourselves for what happened, can we really say that we have forgiven others even if we have told them so? Fiona's father laughed. Fiona, your friend not only listens with his ears, but also understands at the same time. The question he asked is something I will think about all day. Young man, perhaps you should write my sermons because even I will search the scriptures to find the answer to your question, the pastor said. Your perspective has given me a new perspective on the true meaning of forgiveness. I hope you will visit us again, because when someone questions my teachings, it forces me to develop a deep understanding. Fiona and her parents invited me to dinner. I refused, saying that I never eat a big meal before a long run. Fiona asked where I was going. I replied that it was to the university stadium, which had a circle a mile long. I was going to run it at least three or four times, maybe even more if I could. I hadn't planned to go for a run, but now I thought I should. It took about an hour to get to the stadium. I had just put my bag down and was getting ready to start my first lap when I saw Fiona walking towards me, dressed in her gym clothes and wearing a headband, on my head, like mine. We ran together. I had to slow down so she could keep up with me. After three laps, she had to stop. I ran another lap, this time really speeding up. When I finished, I sat down and took out a bottle of water. I took a long sip of water when she spoke. Fiona said, I'm a little out of shape because I didn't have a running partner. So when you mentioned your plans, I thought I should give it a try too. Thanks for slowing down so I could keep up the pace with you. No problem. It's nice to have company. I usually do this alone, I said. If I have time, I also like to go hiking and rock climbing to keep my leisure time varied. Trail of Tears? State Park has great hiking trails, Fiona said. The walk along the cliffs overlooking the Mississippi River can be quite challenging. This is one of those places you don't go to on a rainy day, I said with a smile. If you go, you're just looking for trouble. Once I had cooled down a bit, we walked back to our cars. When I told my parents I'd skip lunch to try and join you for a run, Fiona said, my dad said, then try to get your friend to come to dinner. I told him I just met you during a police investigation. He laughed and said, if that didn't scare him off, he wasn't the one in trouble, right? To be honest, I was thinking about doing something, I said. I was so angry that I could. We're all thinking about it, to be honest, Fiona replied. There are times when I think the simplest solution is to put a bullet between someone's eyes. But our morals won't allow us to do that. If I weren't so emotionally exhausted, I would gladly accept your parents' offer, I said. Until I sort out my emotions, it's best I don't do this. Fiona smiled and said, that's exactly what I thought you'd say. Call me next weekend if the weather is right. We could go camping. I said I would call and went home to start cleaning. I came home and changed into jeans and a t-shirt. I moved my things into the guest bedroom. I was about to collect some trash bags when I heard a knock on the door. Opening it, I discovered that it was my father-in-law and mother-in-law. They were just as devastated as I was. They visited Ginny but could not find out anything. My father-in-law helped me remove the mattress and bed base from the house. My mother-in-law packed the sheets for the trash. They told me they were there to pick up Ginny's clothes and personal belongings. Together, we carefully packed everything. I made it clear to them that I didn't think it was their fault. This prompted me to explain what I had learned so far about the whole situation. After I expressed what I was thinking, they had a better understanding of why I felt the way I did. Even they couldn't understand what Ginny was thinking. We both agreed that there had to be a lot more to figure out. After they left, I vacuumed up what I could. This gave me time to think. Something didn't work out in this whole situation. I walked over to her dressing table, which was littered with everything you could imagine. Ginny never left the house without makeup. It was in the top drawer of the dresser in the back that I discovered the vials. There were seven of them all labeled test samples of a drug in pill form that I didn't recognize. They were only found because I pulled out the entire box. I called Fiona immediately. Fifteen minutes later, the police were at my house again, taking photographs of how and where I found the evidence. They went to the master bathroom and emptied the small trash can. Inside the trash, they found two empty bottles. Fiona arrived, dressed almost exactly as I was, 
and immediately got to work. I heard them talking. Fiona said they would need to find out from the pharmaceutical company I worked for what the drug was for. Treat it as a priority, Fiona said. Looks like this might be the trigger we've been looking for. We'll have to get warrants to search the other women's homes. See Judge Davidson for that. After the team left, Fiona made a short call. Take what you need, Colin. You're coming with me, Fiona said firmly. I won't let you sit here and wonder about something that doesn't have answers right now. Where are we going? I asked, locking the doors. My parents decided to have an impromptu barbecue for anyone in the family who wanted to come, Fiona said. I hope you like volleyball because if I know my family, you'll probably be dragged into a game or two. Can I be expected to be interrogated by your family? I asked. Let's stop at the store so I can buy something for the table. Fiona laughed and said, We'll wait and see. While I was at the grocery store buying sausages and buns, I picked out a beautiful bouquet of spring flowers in a vase for her mom. When I returned to her car, Fiona's eyes sparkled. This is for your mom, because I'm still a married man, I said. It's thanks for the invitation. We didn't talk much the rest of the way, but by the time we arrived, there were already four or five cars on site. We walked around the garage and out into the backyard, where everything was in full swing. Fiona's mother was delighted with the flowers and noted that it was the first time in a long time that she had received flowers from anyone, much less a guest. We played two games of volleyball before someone suggested a touch game of American football. After the football game, everyone was amused that Fiona had brought a real professional. Everyone teased her as a joke. I noticed one little girl sitting off to the side, alone and sad, so I walked over and sat next to her. She was about six years old and had Down syndrome. I introduced myself to her, sitting down on the grass. I don't know what I did, but her eyes lit up and a smile appeared on her face. Everyone fell silent when I told her the story of a lonely monarch butterfly who couldn't fly and thought she never could. By the time I finished, the little girl was smiling because she learned that the little butterfly needed time to gain strength so its wings could dry. When I finished, it was time to eat. A little girl sat next to me. She asked me why I took a little of everything. I whispered that I didn't know who cooked it, so I wanted to make sure I liked it before I went for more. She laughed. Fiona's mom's neighbor said, Thank you, Colin, for making my granddaughter feel like a real person. It's been a long time since I've seen her like this. She is a real person, I said. It is we who must understand that they relate to us and the world in their own unique way. To have a relationship with such a special person, we must be open, ready to adapt to them as they adapt to us. This is more difficult for us because we are too entrenched in our habits, unlike them. I fell silent because I saw tears in the woman's eyes. After dinner, I called my sister to tell her about the little girl I had met and suggested that her daughter and she meet. My sister was in favor, so I gave my mobile number to the baby's grandmother. She lost her parents in a car accident a year ago. Her grandmother is overwhelmed with taking care of everything and is overprotective of her, Fiona said. Who is she talking to on your cell phone? My sister and her daughter have the same situation, I said. It seemed to me that both girls needed a friend like themselves. Fiona snuggled up to me and kissed me tenderly on the cheek. Everyone noticed but said nothing. As we said goodbye for the night, Fiona's mother heard from her neighbor what I had done. Colin, thank you for what you did. Elizabeth is thrilled that she will finally be able to talk to someone who is going through the same thing as her. They will meet at the park tomorrow after school, she said. I don't know what brought you two together, but my husband and I hope we see you again. Fiona gave me a ride home, and I offered to make us coffee, but she declined saying she was going to work to see if there was anything else she could find out. On Monday, I contacted the construction crew to come and repair the ceiling in the master bedroom and repaint the entire room. I called a garbage removal company to bring a container. When it arrived, I threw away the mattress and box spring. By the end of the day, I already had an appointment with a divorce lawyer scheduled for midweek. On Tuesday, I spent the day adding things to the recycling bin. Many things that were stored in the attic were disposed of. Jeannie's father came and we talked. He worried about health care costs. 
I told him that my insurance would remain valid until the divorce was finalized, but she would have to pay for the sharing herself. I had just left the divorce lawyer's office on Wednesday morning when Lucas called. Colin, corporate security just informed me that a sample of a controlled substance from our company found on the wife of all of our salesmen was provided to them by Doug, Lucas said. This is a new drug that is being tested for the treatment of dementia, but in this case it was used because of its side effects. It makes a person feel extremely excited and frees them from any feelings of guilt or fear. Because of the power of this drug, girls took it in high doses, and their minds were open to doing anything. If the police weren't looking for something specifically like that, they would never have found it. From what I just heard, it looks like Doug will be in jail for a very long time, I said. He was providing them all with nothing more than a new version of the drug to get a girl into bed. The question is, how did he get it? Another question I have to ask is what are the legal consequences of its use on unknown test subjects? Was he internal employee working on testing unknown to us? I really have no idea, Colin, Lucas said. I will pass these questions on to higher-ups to see if they can provide answers. You better, because it looks like the corporation was trying to cover their asses, I stated. When they fired Doug so quickly. After this conversation, I felt the need to contact Detective Benton. I asked for her email address. I received it and responded with my own. I returned home and wrote an email with the conversation as I remembered it with my boss, Lucas. Then I sent it. After this was done, I sent a text message saying, Check your email. It may be important. Around three o'clock in the afternoon, I had to sign for receipt of a registered letter delivered to me from Mrs. Douglas Drysdale. It was an offer to meet in person, which included her mobile number. I called her and we agreed to meet on Saturday afternoon at a small, secluded restaurant in Poplar Bluff. I was curious why she chose such a secluded place. Contractors spent Thursday and Friday renovating the master bedroom. Jeannie was formally notified of the divorce in her hospital room. Fiona called late Friday night to see if we were going camping. I explained what I was doing on Saturday, so we agreed to meet at the state park on Sunday at 10 in the morning. Mrs. Drysdale was a remarkably beautiful middle-aged woman. Over dinner, we talked about our divorces. Just as we were about to leave, she handed me a large envelope. Colin, Lucas was telling me about the questions you raised regarding my husband's actual corporate job, Mrs. Drysdale said. Inside the envelope are confidential documents that will answer your questions. For reasons I cannot explain, I must remain in the shadows. So handle these documents very carefully. They are so incriminating for some parties that extreme measures may be taken to prevent their disclosure. After reading the file in my car, I completely understood why she took such extreme measures to give me the information. I called my father for advice on what to do. Dad, I just got my hands on some very damaging inside information, I said. I don't know what to do. This is a legal document related to what happened behind the scenes with Doug Drysdale and my employer. It gives a clear picture of what happened, and it's disgusting. Are you home? asked my father. No, I'm driving back from Bluff, I answered. Don't go home. Your source could be followed, Dad said. Come here with the information and we'll scan it. I'll forward it to an organization that is known for asking questions and never revealing its sources. You'll have to decide who to mail it to, who you deem incapable of corruption. I went to my dad's, and we scanned everything into his computer after he read it. This is extremely incriminating information. It shows that the pharmaceutical company told the authorities nonsense. They are testing a mind-altering drug for the Pentagon and have assigned certain upper-level executives to use it on unknown targets. My father said loudly, Proof of this is what Doug Drysdale wrote in his reports about the six women he chose over the past two years. In essence, all six wives he used were nothing more than his unwilling sex slaves. They maintained their personalities and submitted without questions. If they were told to forget about what they did, they forgot. My father uploaded the file to Wikipedia and sent it. My father printed out a copy of the file. I found the police station address and addressed the new envelope to Detective Benton, 
while wearing surgical gloves. Using gloves, I took the freshly printed copies and placed them in a self-adhesive envelope. After weighing the package, Dad allowed me to use his postal meter to apply the correct stamp. Don't tell anyone, put the envelope in the mailbox that doesn't have cameras, Dab said. Wikipedia will not publish information until their legal team has reviewed it. Just remember to wear surgical gloves when touching it. We don't want it to be known that we had access to it. The problem with Wikipedia's organization is that even though documents show the program was started and funded by the federal government under Obama, all the blame will be placed on Trump. Dad then copied the file onto a flash drive and then deleted it from the computer using a secure deletion program so no trace was left. We burned the original documents in the fireplace. Why is it always impossible to find it when you look for a mailbox? I decided to reset it in the dark of night. I parked my car a block away and dropped it into a busy spot. Fiona was waiting for me when I arrived at the state park with the biggest smile I had ever seen. While I was changing into my hiking boots, we talked about various things. Mom says Elizabeth's stress levels have dropped a lot thanks to her new relationship with your sister, Fiona said. Katie and Sophie, like all children, start to become close friends. It helps Sophie come out of her shell. Has my sister already introduced Elizabeth to the local support group? I asked. I'm not sure. If I find out anything, I'll let you know, Fiona replied. I took my camera bag out of the car. It contained my Canon EOS camera, which was designed for photographers who wanted to capture the amazing views and fine details of whatever they were photographing. I loved it because it allowed me to get close-ups and unique shots of whatever I was photographing. We went hiking. If I stopped to take a photo, I showed her what it looked like before moving on. One of the best shots I took was of a ladybug that was just about to fly away from the petal of the flower it was sitting on. I tried to photograph Fiona whenever I could. I especially liked the ones that showed her determination to overcome difficult parts of the climb or descent. We spent time discussing the flora and fauna that surrounded us on our journey. It was almost four o'clock in the afternoon when we returned to our cars. The hike, which should have taken one to two hours, took us almost six hours. Neither of us discussed the situation that brought us together. Not once. Fiona watched as I opened the trunk and put my camera bag in it. Taking a small cooler out of the trunk, I asked if she had time for cheese, crackers, and white wine. When she said yes, I asked her to take the basket and close the trunk. Setting them out on the picnic table, I unpacked the tablecloth, cutting board, knife, four different types of cheese, and three different types of crackers. Over the next hour, we learned more about each other and our path in life. Before she left, she thanked me for a wonderful day and kissed me tenderly on the cheek. Around seven in the evening, I pulled into my driveway. I was surprised to find my boss, Lucas, waiting for me on my doorstep. Hey, Lucas, what's wrong? I said with a sense of humor. We need to talk about what Mish Spruce Drysdale gave you, he said seriously. After I opened the house, we went to the kitchen and grabbed a cold beer. Colin, Michelle's father is in a high position. He's the head of human resources for America. She met Doug through him, Lucas explained. She knew Doug's Thursday meetings weren't what she was told. I want you to promise to keep her name a secret. I assure you, Lucas, I no longer have the information. It was scanned into the computer before the original file was destroyed, I said. The file was uploaded to Wikipedia, which will take at least a week before it is published. A copy was printed and placed in a new envelope, which was sent to Detective Benton. We made sure that there would be no fingerprints left because we used surgical gloves. When we finished, we used the cleaner Hillary Clinton used to wipe the hard drive. The original file she gave me and the envelope it was in were burned in the fireplace. Lucas smiled as he said, I told Michelle that you would handle this without anyone being held accountable. Thank you for proving me right. Please, I said. Does Michelle know you're in love with her? Yeah, and her dad knows too, Lucas said, pulling out his cell phone. I need to tell him what was done. I listened as Lucas explained everything to Michelle Drysdale's father. Things got interesting when Lucas put the phone on speaker so I could hear what Mr. Levine was saying. Mr. McBride, thank you for the professionalism you have shown in handling this sensitive situation on behalf of the corporation and myself. 
said Bart Levin. Many of us in senior management were strongly opposed to what was being done to innocent people to satisfy a government contract. Bart Levin continued, On Monday we will announce the promotion of Lucas to replace Doug. I'm offering his position to you if you want it. I accept it, but I owe you all a thank you because it ensures that Doug will be away for a long time, I said. I'll need ideas on how to deal with our customers once everything comes out. There will be a lot of questions. How we handle this will help keep potential sales losses to a minimum. The right approach will make the difference. I'm guessing it will be at least a week before it goes online. Wow, said Bart. Lucas, have you always approached your sales territory with this logic? Yeah, he always did. So when you offered me Doug's position, I offered it to you, Lucas replied. Then we have work to do, Bart replied. I'll let marketing know first thing tomorrow about my concerns that I feel like everything is going to blow up. Colin, I'll let Lucas update you on the salary and all the benefits you're getting. Thank you, gentlemen, and good night. Lucas and I sat in the kitchen and had a couple more beers. Everything work-related could wait until tomorrow. I will be working half days next week while I am being trained for a new position. A huge burden has been lifted off everyone's shoulders. I knew that I was working with people who shared my views. I was almost ready for bed when my cell phone rang. It was Dizini, and she wanted to talk in person. I said that I would come to see her at the hospital the next day in the afternoon. I walked into our regional office around ten minutes past eight in the morning. Lucas was already there. Over my first morning coffee, I found out how big of an increase I would get. As a regional sales manager, the bonuses for achieving levels were amazing to me. Now I understood why Lucas was so driven and demanding results from his sales team. At my new level, I was given a choice. I could take the company car or get an annual allowance for the car and provide myself with my own. After learning how little Lucas actually rode, I decided to provide my own. The head office scheduled more sales representatives than we had on staff. So, together with the office assistant, we began to revise the routes and tighten the service area. Using the data, we learned that we had not visited more than 800 of these quick service locations in our area. Since our sales representatives only came into the office one day every three weeks, we had to schedule visits to these locations between four and six in the evening. I discovered that part of my job would be negotiating with hospital administrators about annual prices for the coming year. This will require more courtship and dinners than I'm used to. By lunchtime, my assistant and I sent our division's reorganization proposal to the central office for approval. If it is approved, Lucas will have to hire two more employees and one to replace me. The way in which the new routes were planned allowed each driver to reduce his daily mileage by an average of 150 miles. The annual gas savings alone will save you thousands and provide you with additional time to visit our customers. This eliminated the need for our representatives to regularly be away from their families. In our proposal, I suggested that route updates and revisions be done company-wide at a minimum of every two years. At two o'clock in the afternoon, I walked into Jeannie's room in the hospital. She was now sitting on a plastic ring filled with air. I asked her father to come with me because I wanted to keep calm. We both learned that her memory was fuzzy. All she could remember was that he regularly appeared every six weeks. When her father told her what we know is a fact, she couldn't understand how she could let this happen. She told us that doctors discovered that she was three months pregnant. We both agreed that DNA tests should be done before discussing anything. When we left the room, her father told me that he thought she was lying. I told him not to jump to conclusions yet. Just watch for now, I said. Do you believe her? He asked. I replied that I was filing for divorce due to irreconcilable differences, not for infidelity, because it was the trust that was most broken, not anything else. For my father-in-law, that said it all. I walked into my new office on Wednesday to find that corporate had approved our proposal. Lucas said he had tried this before, but it was the way the economic benefits were presented that made it acceptable to them. You've presented them with increased productivity, reduced costs, and greater coverage. In this game, it's a home run with the bases loaded. 
I took the time to find a florist and order a dozen yellow roses in a beautiful vase for Detective Benton to deliver to her office with a card that said, Thank you for your friendship. It appears she was on the phone with the DA when they were brought in. She sent me a text message as soon as she was free. The flowers are beautiful. Thank you. Dinner at 8 at Red Lobster. I replied, Sounds good? I'll book a table. Before I left at the end of the day at 1 o'clock, I said to the assistant who was helping in the office, Tony, I will be taking over as sales manager starting early next week. I would like you to become my executive assistant. Tony broke into a smile and said, Yes. Tony, since all of our sales reps have GPS, let's do a comparison test over the next three days, I said. By using the date and time of their stops and comparing them to GPS data, we can identify some deceptions that I can use to my advantage at our next meeting of our own. You're not going to fire anyone, right? Tony asked in concern. No, I'm not, Doug. I know everyone has been dealing with a lot of problems, I said. I want to use this as a teaching tool and establish a line of open communication. Oh, I didn't know about that, she said. Now I admire you even more. This also gives us the opportunity to discuss new routes and a four-day work week so they can catch up on paperwork on Friday. I want to emphasize that weekends and evenings should be time for family, not catching up on work, I said. Will I be at the meeting? She was surprised. I believe the assistant should work with me, not under me, I said. When I'm not there to make decisions, your word is law. That's enough. I'm leaving. See you tomorrow. Tony had a wide smile on his face. I could see in her eyes that I had given her the biggest promotion she had ever received in her life. Before I left, I stopped by Lucas's office to tell him that I had made Tony my assistant and explained what her new responsibilities would be. Lucas paused for a moment, considering what I said, then called his secretary, who had transferred to work with him, and informed her of her new title and the responsibilities that came with it. Sherry, let me make this clear. If I am not there and Colin needs approval or disapproval. It is up to you as my assistant to act on my behalf. Whatever you say to him, I will support 100%. You will be involved in every aspect of my work, Lucas said. We'll all be on a learning curve for the next few months, so let's keep that in mind as we make decisions. Now I need to call Brad and convince him of this, Lucas said. Tell him the truth that because marketing has not provided us with protection from the media storm that awaits us, you and I have come together to create this new program to protect our staff and their families, I said. Our job as a sales team is to protect our staff, their families, and make sure what happened never happens again. Lucas laughed. You seize the moment while you can. If this works, you'll rise through the ranks faster than anyone I know. Then a message notification appeared on my mobile phone. Checking it, I saw, I'll be wearing jeans tonight, if that's okay. I replied, good for me. Then called the restaurant to make a reservation for eight. Lucas said, judging by the look on your face, whatever it says, it was good news that made you book a table at the restaurant. Just dinner with a friend, I replied. If it's Detective Benton, be careful, your marriage material in her eyes, he said with a slight laugh. When I met with her to confirm the time of your departure, she asked a lot of questions. We talked. She told me that she already knew that your marriage was over and was very proud of how you were handling it. On the way home, I stopped at a stationery store to buy a frame and some sheets of photo paper. I took a photo of Fiona's glowing face looking up at me, having just slipped and fallen while climbing in a difficult spot as she was ascending. It was a shot that captured the fullness of her bright eyes, which glowed with shared delight. It was as if you could see the laughter coming out of her at that moment. I printed the photo 8 by 10 inches and used a paper cutter to trim the edges. I then framed it into the frame I chose. The wooden frame perfectly accentuated the picture. The remaining images were uploaded to the cloud to be sold and promoted as wallpaper for computer screens. The last thing I did was put the painting in a small gift bag and covered it with construction paper. Fiona met me at the Red Lobster at 8 and we went inside.
She noticed the gift bag but didn't say anything. We ordered the great feast for me. She wanted the scampi. I let her choose the wine. She really liked their cheese biscuits. We both took salad. While we were waiting for the food to begin, I offered her a surprise. Taking the gift bag, she opened it. It was funny to see her eyes sparkle with excitement. It's wonderful. I don't think I've ever seen a photograph that captures me so well, Fiona said. Can you make another copy? Of course, it only takes a minute to print. Why? I asked. I want to give a copy to my parents, Fiona said, because if I don't, they'll just steal this one from me when they see it. Do you want me to frame it, or do you want to do it yourself? I asked. A photograph will suffice, said Fiona. My mom will still replace the frame with one she likes better. During dinner, I informed Fiona about my promotion, which would take effect next week. She asked if it was worth it, and I explained what it entailed. I said the only thing I wouldn't miss was all this traveling from place to place. I spoke to Jeannie for the first time, I explained. Her father was there, and she doesn't remember anything about her time with Doug. Her father thinks she was lying, but I'm not sure. He and I both found out she was pregnant, so we'll do a DNA test. On that note, tell your soon-to-be ex-father-in-law to keep an eye out for the DA's announcement on Friday, Fiona said. That will explain a lot to both of you. I'll go and take her statement tomorrow. That's when the charges will be announced. I asked her if she wanted dessert, and she said no. After paying the bill, she followed me back to my seat. We went into the home office where I printed and cropped another copy of the photo for her. Then I put it in an envelope for her. I took the time to show her where I sold my wallpaper photos. I took her upstairs and showed her the newly renovated master bedroom. Even the carpet in the bedroom was replaced. Fiona seemed impressed. I told Jeannie to come after she was released to take what she wanted from the house. After that, I would change the locks and alarm code. You haven't reordered the bed mattress set yet. Why? Fiona asked. I hope Jeannie takes it as I'll never sleep in it again, I replied. If not, I'll call Sally Ann's. So they could come and get him. Sally Ann, she replied. An acronym or nickname for the Salvation Army. I said. My family always sent them things to sell, so I guess you could call it a family tradition. She took the envelope and headed towards the front door. I followed her. She turned to me. I leaned over and kissed her tenderly on the cheek. With that done, she slipped out the door. I was at work waiting for Lucas when he walked through the office door. I've already made my first mug of coffee. What did Bart say? I asked. I haven't heard a word yet. I don't think they'll go for it. Lucas replied. Send him a text if you can. Just tell him the DA will speak publicly on Friday, I answered. Maybe this will get corporate to move. Lucas looked at me with a questioning look. Detective Benton? Yes, but now it's not the detective. It's Fiona, I replied. We're becoming friends. That's how it started with Mitchelly, he replied as he sent a text message. Lucas's cell phony rang almost immediately. Before answering, he said it was Bart. He told the marketing department to be prepared, and they waved it off. Lucas turned on the speaker. I listened to what they discussed for a while. Gentlemen, I will issue a response after the DA speaks, I said. Both of you will act like you don't know anything. Brad, if you're asked, on Monday morning, you can tell everyone you talked to me and I said what I said to buy the corporation time to develop a plausible answer. Saving our skin again, Colin, Brad said. But how are you going to pull that off? Easy. I'll be in the crowd listening to the DA when he makes his press release, I said. Okay, gentlemen. You both now have executive assistance as a pilot program, Bart said. For one year, and then a final decision will be made based on the results. Lucas looked at me and smiled. He then said goodbye and ended the call. Well done. Are you sure you can pull this off? Just a minute. I'll call you, I said. I went into my office and called a personal friend who worked at a local television station. After explaining the situation, they said that this would be an ideal opportunity for them. I'll be notified when the press is told what time it starts. I walked up to Lucas's office door and said, Everything is set so let's make an announcement to the office staff today. Lucas came out of his office and explained to the staff the promotion of our former assistants and my appointment as sales manager for the region. 
Lucas made it clear that the restructuring of the office and sales routes was made due to the events of the last few weeks. Colin and I believe the changes we have made will allow our staff to spend their personal time more on family time than catching up with work. These steps have been taken to ensure this never happens again. As I left at one o'clock in the afternoon, it was clear that there was new excitement in the air. It was funny to see Fiona standing next to the DA when he revealed what they found in Doug Drysdale's investigation. All six girls received drugs that affect the psyche, believing that they were trying a new type of contraception. The charges against him were finally announced. If found guilty, he faces a long prison sentence. I stood at the entrance to the hall, dressed as I usually dress for the weekend. Fiona finally noticed me, and I saw a smile on her face. The media bustle had been going on for about an hour when I entered the room. As soon as they noticed me, they asked me if I had anything to say. I made it clear that I was not speaking on behalf of the corporation, but as a representative of the staff as a whole in the regional office. I explained the changes in the management structure in the regional office and the appointment of two female assistants to the management team. I emphasized that we had reworked our sales routes and hired additional sales representatives to ensure that this never happened again in our regional office. As a result, our sales staff had to be at home every night. For us in the regional office, I can now say that the family structure of our staff is important to us all. This regional office will focus on protecting the moral values of our employees. After the noise died down, Fiona took my hand and led me to the district attorney. I congratulated him on the insight and truths he brought to light. He said, You were tactfully wise to protect the regional office while leaving the corporation to its fate. I said, I'm just an employee, at least until Monday, and now maybe less than that. The district attorney said, If you lose your job over this, believe me, by the end of the week you'll have a job twice as good. Everyone who sees this on national television will want you on their team. You've proven yourself to be a master of diplomacy. Thanks for the compliment, I replied. All this time, Fiona stood next to me, not letting go of my hand. As I drove her to her car, Fiona said, I handed my mom the photo last night. She thought, as did I, that it was the best picture of me she'd ever seen. Both my parents want to take us to dinner as soon as I can arrange everything. I laughed and said, but I'm still married. In name only, Fiona said. I saw you throw your wedding ring in the trash that Thursday night because the love you had for her had died. I'll be here until you're ready to start loving again. Better call your mom and make this dinner happen, I said, before kissing her on the lips for the first time. Fiona called her mother. It was funny to me to hear her mother squeal with joy. They decided to go to a more expensive restaurant in the casino around 8 o'clock in the evening. The last time I was there was when it had just opened with my parents and we all thought it was a flop. Jeannie texted me to let me know that family would help her move on Saturday. I said I'd make sure I wasn't around. This will allow her to decide for herself, freely, and without arguing with me. I followed Fiona to the house she rented. He was well looked after, and she had two female cats. While I was waiting for her to change, I went in and changed the message on my answering machine to say, I need some alone time. If it's an emergency, send me an email. Otherwise, leave a message, and I'll get back to you tomorrow. Few people knew the uproar this message would cause. The fact that if someone actually listens to it, they will understand that I am not going to respond until tomorrow, no matter the circumstances. The interview with the district attorney made national news. My indirect denial of the events described by the DA, with the disclosure of programs put in place to protect personnel at the regional office, raised many questions. Especially when it was discovered that my soon-to-be ex-wife was one of the victims used in an unauthorized human trial. Surprisingly, the dinner at the upscale casino restaurant was better than the last time I tried it, but still not worth talking about or justifying the price. For a Friday night in the Cape, for the restaurant to not be busy said a lot.
Mr. and Mrs. Benton saw the interview on the local news at six and had a lot of questions. They ended up coming to the same conclusion as me about what trust is. Mrs. Benton couldn't stop talking about the photo I had taken, which was now one of many in the hallway leading up from the first floor. After dinner, Fiona's parents went to the casino to play slot machines. They asked us to join, but I refused, saying that my mother spent many evenings there, and I did not want to remind myself of her. Fiona and I left them and went for a walk along the promenade in the center of the Cape, on the banks of the mighty river. We were lucky because the steamer on wheels was parked overnight. During this walk, I told her the story of my mother and our entire still-living family, not wanting to withhold any details. If Fiona asked any questions, I answered them. Your father set high sacrifices and standards for you as a father, Fiona said. He put raising you and your sibling above everything else. What will you do if Jeannie's child turns out to be yours? That's no longer a question, I said. The medications she was taking caused a spontaneous abortion. Doctors believe that because of the diet she had to follow in the hospital and the medications she was on for so long, thanks to Doug, her body was unable to carry a pregnancy. Oh God, said Fiona, can this problem get any worse? Her life is ruined, as is the life of every other woman who was involved with Doug. Most of them will end up divorced. Their civil suit will cost millions. What else needs to be found out about this drug, I said with importance. What side effects does it cause and what consequences do they have in the long term? Fiona looked at me as if I had hit her with something very important without warning. Gathering her thoughts, she said, When we get home, Fiona replied, I will send an email to the DA about your concerns and why. This is a question he needs to find an answer to as quickly as possible. It was almost eleven at night when I took her home. She invited me inside, but I refused. It was too early for any serious romance. I had just gotten out of the shower and was getting dressed this Saturday morning when my cell phone rang. It was Lucas, and everything went wrong. The corporate department is in a panic. They were upset that marketing didn't take HR's problems seriously. My statement made to protect the regional office was heard throughout the company. The R&D department was in big trouble. What they did was never approved. Heads will roll. Brad was complimented on the way he handled the situation by approving the changes we made. After careful consideration of my initial proposal, the board of directors saw its value in the current situation and told us to apply the changes we made throughout North America. I said, the board of directors is going to kick out the R&D department, saying they were loners working behind the scenes. Colin, the local DA is holding another press release. Do you have any idea what he'll say? Lucas asked. He will ask for details about the side effects of the drug they were experiencing, I said, probably linking it to World War II, Hitler, and their attempts to create a super race. The swear words Lucas said were surprising because he came up with several that I had never used. Surely Wikipedia is watching what's going on, I said, through the liberal media. The information they ask for will only fuel the direction they go with it. I better tell Brad about this, Lucas said. Eventually, as soon as Michelle's divorce is finalized, we will get married. Tell Brad to advise the board of directors to find out who all received these trial drugs and encourage them to take a proactive approach by entering into out-of-court non-disclosure agreements. If they don't take a proactive stance, it will ruin them, I said. Wikipedia will turn this into a marketing tool to attract more donations to their organization, turning a political event into an anti-Trump hate feast. Lucas was about to say something, but I got a second call, so I said I'd call him back. It was Jeannie's father. She was back in the hospital after attempting suicide. The chances of her waking up from her drug-induced coma were slim. Her body gradually shut down, she was now connected to life support machines. I asked who the receiving doctor was, and he told me. I spent the next hour explaining to the doctor what he might be experiencing. He honestly said that they were starting to run tests to see if there was any brain activity. I called Fiona to let her know what was going on. Less than 15 minutes had passed before she arrived at my entrance. She refused to leave my side for the rest of the weekend. 
It was the first time I tried her cooking. Monday was a busy day as I caught up with all of our sales reps on a group call first thing in the morning, introducing them all to Tony, explaining how we would proceed next. I then called the other five whose wives were victims separately to let them know what I thought they should do with their wives from a medical standpoint. Once, they learned about my ex's suicide attempt and her current medical condition. They took my advice seriously. I told them to take a day and find the help they needed to move forward. I think I looked exhausted when Lucas finally walked into my office three hours later. The good news is that we were the only North American office involved in this. Lucas began as he sat down. Two more sites have been discovered, one in Argentina and one in Georgia. A team of lawyers is already in the air to address the issue directly with the victims and their families. Those involved at the corporate office in Vienna have been handed over to Swiss authorities. I nodded my head. Guinea's father and I just had a long talk. Doctors discovered she was brain dead. I'm going to pick him up and we're both going to go let them turn off the life support. I will be in the hospital with him as long as necessary until Jeannie takes her last breath. Lucas saw me stand up and head towards the exit. After I left, he called the staff together and told them everything that was happening. He then entered his office, closed the door, and called Detective Benton to inform her of what was happening. Jeannie was pronounced dead at four o'clock Monday afternoon. Her father and I have made arrangements for cremation with a memorial service. Her ashes will be interred in the family plot in a private ceremony. Early Tuesday morning, a murder charge was added to Doug Drysdale's case. On Wednesday, I returned to work to the surprise of everyone. Tony and I were getting ready for Friday's sales meeting. I informed everyone that a memorial service would be held at Potter House on Saturday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, where my father-in-law was a respected member. When corporate lawyers contacted me regarding my wife and the situation, I told them to contact my father-in-law because any settlement would be split in half. When my father-in-law asked me why, I replied that she had been his daughter longer than she had been my wife. His loss is greater than mine. When I walked into the sales rep's morning meeting on Friday, I received a standing ovation. I started by saying that the last few weeks have been hectic, but it's time to get started. I pointed out that the GPS did not match the locations and times in the sales rep's reports. I said, if you falsify reports and get caught, now Tony or I can fire you. If something comes up and you have to adapt your schedule, pick up the phone and call us. Keep us updated. If we know this, when the higher-ups start asking questions, and you all know there will be questions, we can look at our daily logs and explain. This is where Tony will explain the new routes, the new reporting system, and the new approved bonus system that comes into effect, I said. Tony, you have the floor. She gave a brilliant presentation to the representatives, supported the idea of visiting GP clinics with the increase in market sales that I demonstrated. She made it clear that thinking outside the box and doing a little extra work in the long run resulted in me becoming the youngest sales manager. Each of the sales representatives was delighted because now the system was set up so that they had more time for their families. I must admit that Potter House has done a good job. Bart Levin and his wife were in attendance, as were Michelle and Lucas, and Fiona and her parents. All the sales reps and their significant others showed up to give me moral support. I was surprised to see the DA and his better half. Most of the staff from where Jeannie worked were also present. Those who wanted were invited back to my father's for free food and drinks. We even provided leaflets with instructions on how to get there. Quite a lot of people came. During the service, I sat with Jeannie's parents and my father. During the post-service communication, Bart Levin handed me an envelope saying, This is on behalf of the board of directors as a thank you for the way you handled everything. Your quick response on your part allowed the corporation to mitigate the entire situation, which bout to use time to minimize publicity. Just so you know, we will cover the medical expenses of the sales reps and their wives for life and have agreed to a monetary settlement. Fiona was introduced to my father, Sean McBride, my sister Karen, her husband David, and her daughter Sophie. Everyone noticed how closely she stayed with me all day. My brother couldn't come home. He was overseas in the Air Force. 
Finally, after everyone had left, I relaxed and had my first drink. Fiona brought me a plate of food and said, You should eat something because, knowing you, you haven't eaten anything all day. How do you know? asked my father. Colin always eats better when he's relaxed, Fiona explained. What he faced in recent weeks was easy to imagine. My sister, always curious, asked, Okay, Fiona, how did you meet my brother? With a twinkle in her eye that showed her feelings for me, she said, I was called on Thursday night because Control thought there might have been a shooting. The first time I met your brother, he was sitting on the couch in handcuffs with a smile on his face. Colin, was she the detective who investigated all of this? My sister asked. Yes, I said. By the end of the first weekend, we were starting to become friends. With what we both went through, it brought us closer. So, to satisfy your curiosity, we are both interested in seeing where this takes us. Karen, Colin was with my parents when he called you about Elizabeth and her granddaughter. I encouraged him to come so he wouldn't have to worry about unanswered questions, Fiona said. It was watching him interact with Katie that made me want to get to know your brother better. Our region just completed two of its best quarters ever. The overall growth coming from this area was in the top 100 worldwide. We had many reasons to rejoice. My former father-in-law was able to retire early. The section we signed up for, even after sharing with me, secured him for life. Doug Drysdale's trial has concluded, and he has been found guilty on all counts. I sold the house with all the furniture and moved in with my father. The 2,000 shares that the board of directors gave me were in a safe deposit box at the bank. Fiona and I are still together. Her birthday was on Sunday. Her parents threw a birthday party at home A. This time, my whole family will be present. Even my brother John, who was home on holiday. It was a joy to watch Fiona open her birthday presents one by one. I retreated without saying a word. It was funny to hear whispers that I had nothing for her, and everyone wondered why. Just as Fiona was about to thank everyone for the wonderful gifts, I walked up to her and stopped her in her tracks. Fiona, you told me you would wait until I was ready to love again. I don't know when it happened, but it happened, I said, getting down on one knee and taking the ring box out of my pocket. Fiona, will you marry me? Fiona was as amazed as everyone else, except for one thing, because we hadn't even discussed it. Luckily, she said yes. We cemented our union with a very public, passionate kiss. The birthday turned into an even bigger celebration for both of us. Later, we returned to her rented house, celebrating in our own way. We were getting heated, and I started undoing my buttons when she said, We're both going to have to take a cold shower because I'm not taking my pills. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.